Namaste. Assalamu alaikum. Shalom. Nihao. Buenos dias. Hesitate. Aquaba. Welcoming. What up, though? This is weekly Holy Scriptures recorded recitation. The Parsha, the portion for this week is Chukat, which is numero 39. 39. Um, so the date today is 124.10.14, yo pongo. Semicolon 72, semicolon 1, new 4, which means they may actually be 10, 15. So there it is. Um, portion is weak. Numero, bien, numero 39. It includes from the Torah, Chukat, which is Bemidbar 19.1 a 22.1 within the Bhagavad Gita. It is the Karma Yogahe, uh, which is numero tres. Uh, in the Dignakai, it is the Agana Sutta, which is numero 27. Within the Gospels, it is John 9 a 10. Within the Quran, it is Surah Ad. Dariat and Surah Atur, pronunciation improving, ha -ha. Uh, which is 51 and 52. Uh, in the Tao Te Ching, it is chapters 67 and 72. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Allah wa Ta'ala. Deus nos de qui es en celis, santificito nome tuum, vahigu sanam. Dao que dao fejum dao. Ja! Baruchata Arunai, Eloheinu melecha alam, hamotzi, lechem min haaretz. Amen. Kiri elesu. Sivu mastu, salva jigatehi. Sabe seta bovante sukita ta. Fagabiem. Ubuntu, Shabona, Fekako, Akwaba, Upin, Amani, Omejeka, Sheshe, Kamosanida, Domo Aregato, Hidoma Yellow Wokantoka, Talk of Dokushin, Good. God, we thank you for that you bless us. Go with God. Ata Jamia Yatafman, Aho, Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti.
Torah, Jukat, Bemidbar, 19-1 a 22-1. The Lord spoke to Moshe and Aaron, saying, This is the statute of the Torah which the Lord commanded, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and have them take for you a perfectly red unblemished cow upon which no yoke was laid. And you shall give it to Eleazar the Kohen, and he shall take it outside the camp and slaughter it in his presence. Eleazar the Kohen shall take from its blood with his finger and sprinkle it towards the front of the tent of meeting seven times. The cow shall then be burned in his presence, its hide, its flesh, its blood, with its dung he shall burn it. The coin shall take a portion of the cedar wood, hyssop, and crimson wool, and cast them into the burning of the cow. The coin shall wash his garments, and bathe his flesh in water, and then he may enter the camp, and the coin shall be unclean until evening. The one who burns it shall wash his clothes in water, and cleanse his body in water, and he shall be unclean until evening. A ritually clean person shall gather the cow's ashes and place them outside the camp in a clean place, and it shall be as a keepsake for the congregation of the children of Israel for sprinkling water utilized for cleansing. The one who gathers the cow's ashes shall wash his clothes, and he shall be unclean until evening. It shall be an everlasting statute for the children of Israel and for the proselyte who resides in their midst. Anyone touching the corpse of a human soul shall become unclean for seven days. On the third and seventh days, he shall cleanse himself with it, so that he can become clean. But if he does not sprinkle himself with it on the third and seventh days, he shall not become clean. Whoever touches the corpse of a human soul which dies, and he does not cleanse himself, he has defiled the Mishkan of the Lord, and that soul shall be cut off from Israel. For the sprinkling water was not sprinkled on him, so he remains unclean, and his uncleanness remains upon him. This is the law. If a man dies in a tent, anyone entering the tent and anything in the tent shall be unclean for seven days. Any open vessel which has no seal fastened around it becomes unclean. Anyone who touches one slain by the sword or a corpse or a human bone or a grave in an open field, he shall be unclean for seven days. They shall take for that unclean person from the ashes of the burnt purification offering, and it shall be placed in a vessel filled with spring water. A ritually clean person shall take the hyssop and dip it into the water and sprinkle it on the tent on all the vessels and, all, and on the people who were in it, and on anyone who touched the bone, the slain person, the corpse, or the grave. The ritually clean person shall sprinkle on the unclean person on the third day and on the seventh day, and he shall cleanse him on the seventh day, and he shall wash his clothes and bathe in water, and he should become ritually clean in the evening. If a person becomes unclean and does not cleanse himself, that soul shall be cut off from the congregation, for he has defiled the sanctuary of the Lord. The sprinkling waters were not sprinkled upon him, he is unclean. It shall be for them as a perpetual statute, and the one who sprinkles the sprinkling water shall, shall wash his clothes, and one who touches the sprinkling water shall be unclean until, until evening. Whatever the unclean one touches shall become unclean, and anyone touching him shall be unclean until evening. The entire congregation of the children of Israel arrived at the desert of Zin in the first month, and the people settled in Kadesh. Miriam died there and was buried there. The congregation had no water, so they assembled against Moshe and Aaron. The people quarreled with Moshe, and they said, If only we had died with the death of our brothers before the Lord. Why have you brought the congregation of the Lord to this desert so that we and our livestock should die, he should die there? Why have you taken us out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It is not a place for seeds or for fig trees, grapevines or pomegranate trees, and there is no water to drink. Moshe and Aaron moved away from the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting, and they fell on their faces. Then the glory of the Lord appeared to them. The Lord spoke to Moshe, saying, Take the staff and assemble the congregation, you and your brother Aaron, and speak to the rock in their presence so that it will give forth its water. You shall bring forth water for them from the rock and give the congregation and their livestock to drink. Moshe took the staff from before the Lord as Adonai had commanded him. Moshe and Aaron assembled the congregation in front of the rock and he said to them, Now listen, you rebels, can we draw water for you from this rock? Moshe raised his hand and struck the rock with his staff twice when an abundance of water gushed forth and the congregation and their livestock drank. The Lord said to Moshe and Aaron, since you did not have faith in me to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly to the land which I have given them. 
These are the waters of dispute, my Meribah, where the children of Israel contended with the Lord, and Adonai was sanctified through them. Moshe sent messengers from Kadesh to the king of Edom. So says your brother Israel, you know of all the hardship that has befallen us. Our fathers went down to Egypt, and we sojourned in Egypt for a long time, and the Egyptians mistreated us and our forefathers. We cried out to the Lord, and Adonai heard our voice. Adonai sent an angel, and he took us out of Egypt, and now we are in Kadesh, a city on the edge of your border. Please let us pass through your land. We will not pass through fields or vineyards, nor will we drink well water. We will walk along the king's road, and we will turn neither to the right nor to the left until we have passed through your territory. Adam replied to him, you shall not pass through me, lest I go out towards you with the sword. The children of Israel said to him, We will keep to the highway, and if we drink your water, either I or my cattle, we will pay its price. It is truly nothing. I will pass through on foot. But he said, You shall not pass through. And Adam came out towards them with a vast force and with a strong hand. Adam refused to allow Israel to cross through his territory, so Israel turned away from him. They traveled from Kadesh, and the entire congregation of the children of Israel arrived at Mahor. The Lord said to Moshe and Aaron at Mount Hor, on the border of, on the, of the land of Edom, saying, Aaron shall be gathered to his people, for he shall not come to the land which I have given to the children of Israel, because you defied my word at the waters of dispute, my Meribah. Take Aaron and Eleazar his son, and ascend Mount Hor. Strip Aaron of his garments, and dress Eleazar his son with them. Then Aaron shall be gathered to end to his people, and die there. Moshe did as the Lord commanded him. They ascended Mount Hor in the presence of the entire congregation. Moshe then stripped Aaron of his garments and dressed Eleazar his son in them. And Aaron died there on the top of the mountain. Then Moshe and Eleazar descended from the mountain. The whole congregation saw that Aaron had expired, and the entire house of Israel wept for Aaron for thirty days. The Canaanite king of Arad who lived in the south, heard that Israel had come by the route of the spies, and he waged war against Israel and took from them a captive. Israel made a vow to the Lord and said, <clears throat> If you deliver this people into my hand, I shall consecrate their cities. The Lord heard Israel's voice and delivered the Canaanite. Adonai destroyed them and consecrated their cities, and he called the place Hormah. They journeyed from Mount Hor by way of the Sea of Reeds to circle the land of Edom, and the people became disheartened because of the way. The people spoke against God and against Moshe. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in this desert? For there is no bread or no water, and we are disgusted with this rotten bread. The Lord sent against the people the venomous snakes, and they bit the people, and many people of Israel died. The people came to Moshe and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that Adonai remove the snakes from us. So Moshe prayed on behalf of the people. The Lord said to Moshe, make, sure, make yourself a serpent and put it on a pole, and let whoever is bidden look at it and live. Moshe made a copper snake and put it on a pole, and whenever a snake bit a man, he would gaze up upon the copper snake and live. The children of Israel journeyed on and, and camped at Obot. They journeyed from Obot and camped in the wasteland passes in the wilderness, which faced Moab towards the rising Soleil. From there they journeyed, and they encamped along the stream of Zered. From there they journeyed, and they encamped on the other side of the Arnon, which was in the desert, extending from the Amorite border. For Arnon was the Moabite border between Moab and the Amorites. Concerning this, it is told in the account of the wars of the Lord, what Adonai gave at the Sea of Reeds and the streams of Arnon, and the spilling of the streams that turned to the settled at Ar and, lead, and leaned towards the border of Moab. From there to the well, that is the well of which the Lord said to Moshe, Gather the people, and I will give them water. Then Israel sang this song, Ascend well, sing to it. A well dug by princes, carved out by nobles of the people, through the lawgiver with their staffs, and from the desert a gift. From the gift to the streams, and from the streams to the heights. From the heights to the valley, in the field of Moab, at the top of the peak that overlooks the wastelands. Israel sent messengers to Sihon, the king of the Amorites, saying, let me pass through your land. We will not turn into fields or vineyards, nor drink well water. We shall walk along the king's road until we have passed through your territory. 
But Sichon did not permit Israel to pass through his territory, and Sichon gathered all his people and went out to the desert towards Israel. He arrived at Yahaz and fought, Israel, fought against Israel. Israel smote him with a sword and took possession of his land from Arnon to Yabok, as, as distant as the children of Ammon, for the border of the children of Ammon was strong. Israel took all these cities, and the Israelites dwelt in all the cities of the Amorites in Hezron and all its villages. For Hezron was the city of Sichon, king of the Amorites, and he had fought against the first king of Moab, taking all his land from his possession, as distant as Arnon. Concerning this, those who speak in parables say, Come to Hezron, may be built and established as the city of Sichon. For fire went forth from Hezron, a flame from the city of Sichon. It consumed Ar of Moab, the masters of the high places of Arnon. Woe is to you, Moab, you are lost, people of Hermosh. His sons he has given over as refugees, and his daughters into captivity, to Sichon, king of the Amorites. Their kingdom is destroyed from Heshbon, it has been removed from Dibon. We laid them waste as distant as Nophah, which is near Medeba. Israel settled in the land of the Amorites. Moshe sent men to spy out Yazer, and they captured its villages, driving out the Amorites who lived there. Then they turned and headed north towards the Bashan. Og, the king of Bashan, came out towards them with all his people to wage war at Edrai. The Lord said to Moshe, Do not fear him, for I have delivered him, his people, and his land into your hand. You shall do to him as you did to Sichon, the king of the Amorites, who dwells in his one. They smote him, his sons, and all his people, until there was no survivor, and they took possession of his land. The children of Israel journeyed and encamped in the plains of Moab, across the Jordan from Jericho. Bhagavad Gita, Karma Yoga Hill. Numero Tres. Arjuna said, If you hold, O Janadharna, that knowledge is superior to action, why then, O Kisava, do you engage me in this terrible action? With these apparently contradictory words, you seem to confuse my understanding. Therefore, tell me definitely that one thing by which I shall reach the highest goal. Sri Krishna said, Even of your, O sinless one, a twofold devotion was taught by me to the world devotion to knowledge for the contemplative, and devotion to work for the active. Not by merely abstaining from action does a man reach the state of actionlessness, nor by mere renunciation does he arrive at perfection. Verily no one can remain even for an instant without doing work, for driven by the gunas of born of Prakriti, everyone is made to act in spite of himself. He who restrains his organs of action but continues to dwell in his mind on the objects of the senses deludes himself and is called a hypocrite. But he who restrains his senses with his mind and directs his organs of action to work with no feeling of attachment, he or Arjuna is indeed superior. Do your allotted action, for action is superior to inaction, and even the bare maintenance of your body will not be possible if you remain inactive. The world becomes bound by action unless it be done for the sake of sacrifice. Therefore, O, o, our, o son of Kunti, give up attachment and do your work for the sake of the Lord. The Prajapati in the beginning created men together with sacrifice and said, By this shall you multiply. Let this be the cow of plenty and yield unto you the milk of your desire. With sacrifice you shall nourish the angels, and may the angels nourish you. Thus, nourishing one another, you will obtain the highest benevolence. The angels nourished by sacrifice will bestow on you the enjoyments you desire. He is verily a thief who enjoys the things that they give without offering to them anything in return. Benevolent men who eat the remnant of the sacrifice are freed from all sins, but wicked men who cook food only for themselves verily eat sin. 
From food, all creatures are born. From rain, food is born. From sacrifice comes rain. Sacrifice is born of action. Know that action arises from the Vedas and the Vedas from the imperishable. Therefore, the all-pervading Vedas ever rest in sacrifice. Thus was the wheel set in motion, and he who does not follow it, but takes delight in the senses and lives in sin, o parta, lives in vain. But verily the man who rejoices in the self and is satisfied with the self and is content in the self alone, he has nothing for which he should work. He has no object to gain by what he does in this world, nor any to lose by what he leaves undone. Nor is there anyone amongst all beings on whom he needs on whom he need depend for any object. Therefore always do without attachment the work you have to do, for a man who does his work without attachment attains the supreme. Verily by action alone men like Janaka attain perfection. Further you should perform work with a view to guiding people along the right path. Whatever a great man does that others follow, whatever he sets up as a standard that the world follows. I have, O Parta, no duty. There is nothing in the three worlds that I have not gained and nothing that I have not yet that I have yet to gain. Yet I continue to work. For I should for should I not ever engage unwearied in action, O Parta, men would in every way follow in my wake. If I should cease to work, these worlds would perish. I would cause the mixture of castes and destroy all these creatures. As the ignorant act attached to their work, O Bharata, so should an enlightened man without attachment in order that he may set people on the right path. Let no enlightened man unsettle the understanding of the ignorant who are attached to action. He should engage them in action himself, performing it with devotion. All work is performed by the gunas of Prakriti, but he whose mind is deluded by egotism thinks, I am the doer. But, O oh mighty Arjuna, he who knows the truth about the gunas in action and what is distinct from them holds himself unattached, perceiving that it is the gunas that are occupied by the gunas, with the gunas. Those who are deluded by the gunas of Prakriti attach themselves to the actions that those gunas prompt. Nevertheless, let no man who knows the whole unsettle the minds of the dull-witted Golino apart. Surrendering all action to me with mind intent on the self, freeing yourself from longing and selfishness, fight, unperturbed by grief. Thus, those who, full of faith, ever follow this teaching of mine and do not carp at me, they too are released from their works. But those who carp at my teaching and practice it not know that such senseless men, blind, blind to all wisdom, are doomed to destruction. Even the man of knowledge acts in accordance with his own nature, all beings follow their nature. What can restraint do? The love and hatred that the senses feel for their objects are inevitable, but let no one come under their sway, for they are one's enemies. Better is, in, is one's own dharma, though imperfectly performed, than the dharma of another well performed. Better is death in the doing of one's own dharma, the dharma of another is fraught with peril. Arjuna said, but under what compulsion does a man commit sin, O Varshaneya? in spite of himself, and driven, as it were, by force. Sri Krishna said, It is desire, it is wrath which springs from rajas. Know that this is our enemy here, all devouring and the cause of all sin. As fire is concealed by smoke, as a mirror by dust, and as an unborn babe, as an unborn babe by the womb, so is knowledge concealed by ignorance. Enveloped in knowledge, O son of Kunti, by the insatiable fire of desire, which is the constant foe of the wise. The senses, the mind, and the understanding are said to be its seat. Though these it veils knowledge and deludes, through these it veils knowledge and deludes the embodied soul. Therefore, O Master of the Bharatas, control your senses, and at the outset, enslave this foul destroyer of knowledge and realization. The senses are superior, they say. Superior to the senses is, this, is the mind. Superior to the mind is the understanding. Superior to the understanding is Brahman. Therefore, no Brahman. Who is superior to the understanding? Who the self by the self, and control the self by the self. And destroy, O my dear Arjuna, the enemy who comes in the guise of desire and is hard to overcome.
Thus have I heard. The exalted one was once staying the Diga Nikaya, the Agana Sutta numero 27. Thus have I heard. The exalted one was once staying near Savati in the East Park at the mansion of the Moor of Megara. Now at that time, Vaseta and Bharadvaja were passing their probation amongst the brethren desiring to become bhikshus. Then at evening time, the exalted one, having arisen from his meditations, had come down from the house and was walking to and fro in the open air in the shade of the house. Now Vaseta saw this, and on seeing it, he, said, he told Bharadvaja, adding, Let us go, friend Bharadvaja. Let us approach the exalted one, for perchance we, he, we might have the benevolent fortune to hear from the exalted one a talk on matters of doctrine. <coughs> Even so, friend Bharadvaja made reply, so Vesaita and Bharadvaja went and approached the Exalted One, and having saluted him, they walked after him as he walked to and fro. You, Vesaita, being Brahmins by birth and family, have gone forth from a fam Brahmin family, your home, into the homeless life. Do not the Brahmins blame and revile you? Yea, verily, Master, the Brahmins do. Then the Exalted One said to Vesaita, You, Vesaita, being Brahmins by birth and family, have gone forth from a Brahmin family, your home into the homeless life. Do not the Brahmins blame and revile you? Yea, verily, Master, the Brahmins do blame and revile us with characteristic abuse, copious, not at all stinted. But in what words, Vesaita, do they so blame you? The Brahmins, Master, say thus. The Brahmin class is the best. But in what terms, Vesaita, do the Brahmins blame and censor you to do to this extent? The Brahmins, Master, say thus. Only a Brahmin is of the best social grade, other grades are low. Only a Brahmin is of clear complexion, other complexions are swarthy. Only Brahmins are of pure breed, not they that are not of the Brahmins. Only Brahmins are genuine children of Brahma, born of his mouth, offspring of Brahma, created by Brahma, heirs of Brahma. As for you, you have renounced the best rank and have gone over to that low class, to shaven recluses, to the vulgar rich, to them of swarthy skins, to the foot-born descendants. Such a course is not benevolent, such a course is not proper. Even this, that you have forsaken that upper class should associate with an inferior class, to wit, with shaving friar folk, menial, swarthy of, swarthy of skin, the offscouring of our kinsmen's heels. In these terms, Master, do the Brahmins blame and revile us with characteristic abuse, copious, not at all stinted. Surely, they say that the Brahmins have quite forgotten the past, the ancient lore, when they say so. On the contrary, Brahmanis, the wives of Brahmins, are known to be fertile, are seen to be with child, bringing forth and nursing children. And yet it is these very womb-born Brahmins who say that Brahmins are genuine children of Brahma, born from his mouth, his offspring, his creation, and his heirs. By this they make a travesty of the nature of Brahma. It is false what they say, and great is the demerit that they thereby earn. There are these four classes, Vesita, nobles, Brahmins, tradesfolk, work people. Now here and there, a noble deprives a living being of life, is a thief, is unchaste, speaks lies, slanders, utilizes rough words, is a gossip, or greedy, or malevolent, or holds wrong views. Thus we see that qualities which are unethical and considered to be such, which are blameworthy and considered to be such, which are not to be sought after and are so acquired, are so considered, which are unworthy of an Aryan and are so considered, qualities sinister of it and, and of sinister effect, discontenanced by the wise, are to be found here and there in such a noble. And we may say are as much concerning Brahmins, trace folk, and work people. Again, here and there, a noble abstains from murder, theft, and chastity, lying, slandering, gossiping, greed, malevolence, and false opinions. Thus we see that qualities which are and are considered ethical, inoffensive, unexceptional, truly Aryan, benign and of benign effect, commanded by the wise, are to be found here and there in a noble. And we may say as much concerning each of the others, Brahmins, trades, folk, and work people. Now seeing, Vesaita, that both bad and benevolent qualities, blamed and praised, blamed and honored, respectively by the wise, are thus distributed amongst each of the four classes, the wise do not admit those claims which the Brahmins put forward, and why? Because, Vesaita, whoever amongst all of these four classes becomes a bhikshu, an arahat, one who has destroyed the deadly taints, who has lived the life, has done that which has to, was to be done, has laid down the burden, has attained his own salvation, has destroyed the fetter of rebirth, and has become free because he has perfected knowledge. He is declared chief amongst them, and in and that in virtue of a norm, a standard, and not irrespective of a norm. For a norm, Vesaita, is the best amongst his folk, both in this life and in the next.
The following Vesita is an illustration for understanding how a norm is the best amongst this folk, both in this life and in the next. King Pasanadi, of course, is aware that the Samana Gotama has gone forth from the adjacent clan of the Sakyas. And the Sakyas are become the vassals of King Pasanadi. They render to him homage and respectful salutation. They rise and do him obeisance and treat him with ceremony. Now, just as the Sakyans treat King Pasanadi of Kosala, so does the king treat the Tapagata. For he thinks, is not the Samana Gotama well born? Then I am not well born. The Samana Gotama is strong, I am weak. He is attractive, I am not comely. The Saman, the Samana Gotama has great influence, I have but little influence. Now it is because of the king honors a norm, reveres a norm, regards a norm, is homage to a norm, holds sacred a norm, that he renders homage and respectful salutation to the God Tatagata, rising and doing himself obeisance and treating him with ceremony. By this illustration may be understood how a not norm is the best amongst this folk, both in this life and in the next. You, Beseta, who differing all of you in birth, in name, in clan, and family have gone forth from home into the homeless life, may he be may be asked, Who are you? That ye then do ye reply. Then do ye reply, We be Samanas, who follow him of the sons of the Sakyans. He Veseta, whose faith in the Tathagata is settled, rooted, established, and firm, a faith not to be dragged down by recluse or Brahmin, by Deva or Mara or Brahma or anyone in the world, may he, well may he say, I am a venerable son of the Exalted One, born from his mouth, born of the Dhamma, created by the Dhamma, heir of the Dhamma, and why? Because Veseta, these are names tantamount to Tathagata, belonging to the Dhamma, and again, belonging to the highest, and again, one with the Dhamma, and again, one with the highest. There comes a time, Vesita, when sooner or later, after a lapse of a long, long period, this world passes away. And when this happens, beings have mostly been reborn in the world of radiance, and there they dwell made of mind, feeding on rapture, self-luminous, traversing the air, continuing in glory, and thus they remain for a long, long period of time. There comes also a time, Vesita, when sooner or later this world begins to re-evolve. When this happens, beings who had deceased from the world of radiance usually come to life as humans. And they become made of mind, feeding on rapture, self luminous, traversing the air, continuing in glory, and remain thus for a long, long period of time. Now, at that time, all had become one world of dark water and of darkness that maketh blind. No moon nor soleil appeared, no stars nor were seen, nor constellations, neither was night manifest, nor day, neither moth, months nor half months, neither years nor seasons, neither fem female nor male. Beings were reckoned just as beings only. And to those beings, they say that sooner or later, after a long time, earth is, with its savor was spread out in the waters. Even as the scum forms on the surface of boiled milk, rice that is cooling, so did the earth appear. It became endowed with color, with odor, and with taste. Even as well-made ghee or butter, pure butter, so was its color, even as the flawless honey of the bee, so sweet was it. Then Veseta, some being of greedy disposition, said, Lo now, what will this be? And tasted the savory earth with his finger. He thus, tasting, became suffused with the savor, and craving entered into him, and other beings following his example tasted the savory earth with their finger. They thus tasting became suffused with the savor. A craving entered into them, and they began, and those beings began to feast on the savory earth, breaking off lumps of it with their hands. And from the doing thereof, the self-luminous of those being faded away. As their self-luminous self-luminance faded away, the moon and the soleil became manifest. Thereupon, star shapes and constellations became manifest. Thereupon night and day became manifest, months, two and a half months, the seasons and the years. Thus distant, they said, did the world evolve again. Now those beings, they said, that feasting on the savory earth, feeding on it, nourished by it, continued thus for a long, long while. And in measure they, as they thus fed, did their bodies become solid and did variety in their com comeliness become manifest. Some beings were well-favored, some were ill-favored, and herein they were... They that were ill, well favored despise them that were ill favored, thinking, We are further comely than they, they are worse favored than we. And whilst they 
threw pride in their beauty, thus became vain and conceited. The savory earth disappeared. At the disappearance of the savory earth, they gathered themselves together and bewailed it. Alas for the savor, alas for the savor. Even so now, when men having gotten a benevolent savor say, Ah, the savor of it, ah, the savor of it. They do but follow an ancient primordial saying, not recognizing the significance thereof. Then Viseta, when the savory earth had vanished for those beings, outgrowths appeared in the soil. The manner of the rising up thereof was as the springing up of the mushroom. It had color, odor, and taste, even as well-formed ghee or fine butter, so was the color thereof, and even as flawless honeycomb was the, so was the sweetness thereof. Then those beings began to feast on these outright growths of the soil. And they feasting on them, finding food and nourishment in them, continued for a long, long while. And in measure, as they thus fed and were thus nourished, so did their bodies grow ever further solid and in difference, and their culminus further manifest, some becoming well-favored, some ill-favored. Then they that were well-favored despised them that were ill-favored, thinking, We are further comely than they, they are worse favored than we. And whilst they, through pride in their beauty, thus became vain and conceited, these outgrowths of the soil disappeared. Thereupon creeping plants appeared, and the manner of the growth thereof was a was as that of the bamboo, and they had colored and they had color, odor, and taste. Even as well made ghee or fine butter, so was the color thereof, even as flawless honeycomb, so was the sweet sweetness thereof. Then they say that those beings began to feast on the creepers, and they, feasting on them, feeding on them, nourished by them, continued so for a long, long while. And in measure as they thus fed and were nourished, did their bodies get wax further, solid. And the divergence in their cleanliness increased, so that, as before, the, bad, the better favor despised the worse favor. And whilst those through pride in their beauty became vain and conceited, the creepers disappeared. At the disappearance thereof, they gathered themselves together and bewailed, saying, Verily it was ours the creeper, now it has vanished away. Alas, and O me, we have lost. Even so now, when men being asked what is the matter, say, Alas, O me, and O me, what we had that have we lost. They do but follow an ancient primordial saying, not recognizing the significance thereof. Then Viseta, when the creepers had vanished for those beings, rice appeared ripening in open spaces. No potter had it, and no husk. Pure, fragrant, and clean-grained, whereof an evening they gathered and carried away for supper. There next matin the rice stood ripe and grown again. Whilst in the matin they gathered and carried away for breakfast, there in the evening it stood ripe and grown again. No break was to be seen where the husks had been broken off. Then those beings feasting on this rice in the clearings, feeding on it, nourished by it, so continued for a long, long while. And in measure as they thus feeding went on existing, so did the bodies of those beings become even further solid, and the divergence in their columnists further pronounced. And the female appeared the distinctive features of the female, and the male those of the male. Then truly did woman contemplate man too closely, and man woman. And then contemplating over much the one the other, passion arose, and burning entered, entered their body. They in consequence thereof followed their lusts. And beings seeing them so doing through some sand and beings seeing them so doing through some sand, some ashes, some cow dung crying, perish fall one, perish fall one. How can a being treat a being so? Even so now when men in certain districts when a bride is led away, throw either sand or ashes or cow dung. They do but follow an ancient enduring primordial form, not recognizing the significance thereof. That which was reckoned unethical at that time, basically, is now reckoned to be ethical. 
Those beings who at that time followed their lusts were not allowed to enter a village or town either for a whole month or even for two months. And inasmuch as those beings at that time quickly incurred blame for an ethic, a lack of ethics, they set to work to make huts to conceal just that lack of ethicism. Then Veseta, this occurred to some being of a lazy disposition. Lo now, why do I wear myself out fetching rice for supper in the evening and in the matin for breakfast? What if I were to fetch enough rice for supper and breakfast together? So he gathered at one journey enough rice for the two meals together. Then some being came to him and said, Come, benevolent being, let us go rice gathering. That's not wanted, benevolent being. I have fetched rice for the evening and matin meal. Then the former followed his example and fetched rice for two days at once, saying, So much they say will about do. Then some other being came to this one and said, Come, benevolent being, let us go rice gathering. And he, never mind, benevolent being, I have fetched rice enough for two days. And so in like manner they stored up rice enough for four and then for eight days. Now, from the time they say that those beings began to feed on hoarded rice, powder enveloped the clean grain, and husk enveloped the grain, and the reaped or cut stems did not grow again. A break became manifest where the reaper had cut. The rice stubble stood in clumps. Then those beings, they say, to gather themselves and bewail this, saying, Evil custom sirs have appeared amongst the men. For in the past we were made of mind, we made, we fed on rapture, self-luminous, we traversed the air in abiding loveliness. Long, long the period we so remained. For us, sooner or later, after a long, long while, the savory earth had arisen over the waters. Color it had, and odor and taste. We set to work to make the earth into lumps and feast on it. And as we did so, our self-luminous vanished away. When it was gone, moon and soleil became manifest, stars and shapes and constellations, night and day, the months and half-months, the seasons and the years. We, enjoying the savory earth, feeding on it, nourished by it, continued so for a long, long while. But since evil and unethical customs became rife amongst us, the savory earth disappeared. When it had ceased, outgrowths of the soil became manifest, clothed with color, odor, and taste. Then we began to enjoy and fed on nourished and nourished thereby. We continued so for a long, long while. But when evil and unethical customs arose amongst us, these outgrowths disappeared. When they had vanished, creepers appeared clothed with color, odor, and taste. Then we turned to enjoy and fed and nourished, thereby we continued so for a long, long while. But since evil and unethical customs became prevalent amongst us, the creepers also disappeared. When they had ceased, rice appeared, ripening in open spaces without powder, without husk, pure, fragrant, and clean and green where we plucked and took away for the next evening meal every evening. Their next meal matin, it had grown ripe again. Where we plucked and took away for the matin meal, there in the evening it had grown ripe again. There was no break visible. Enjoying this rice, feeding on it, nourished by it, we have so continued a long, long while. But from evil and none of the customs being manifest amongst us, powder has enveloped the clean grain, husk too has enveloped the clean grain, and where we have reaped is no regrowth. A break has come, and the rice stubble stands in clumps. Come now, let us divide off the rice fields and set boundaries thereto. And so they divided off the rice and set up boundaries round it. Now some being, they say, of greedy disposition, watching over his plot, stole another plot and made utilization of it. They took him and holding him fast said, Truly benevolent being, thou hast wrong, wrought evil in that whilst watching thine own plot, thou hast stolen another plot and made utilization of it. See, benevolent being, that thou do not such a, a thing again. I, sir, he replied. And a second time he did so. And yet a third. And yet again he took him and admonished him. Some smote him with the hand, some with pods, some with sticks. With such a beginning, they said did stealing appear and censure and lying and punishment became known. Now those beings, they say, to gather themselves together and bewail these things, saying, From our evil deeds, sir, is becoming manifest inasmuch as stealing, censure, lying, punishment have become known. What if we were to select a certain being who should be wrathful when indignation is right and who should censure that which should rightly be censured and should banish him who deserves to be banished but we will give him in return a proportion of the rice then they say to those beings went to the being amongst them who was the handsomest the best favored the most attractive the most capable and said to him come now benevolent being 
be indignant at that where at one should rightly be indignant. Censure that which should rightly be censured. Banish him who deserves to be banished, and we will continue and contribute to thee a proportion of our rice. And he consented and did so, and they gave him a proportion of their rice. Chosen by the whole people, they say, is what is meant by Mahasamata. So Mahasamata, the great elect, was the first standing phrase to arise from such a one. Master of the fields is what is meant by Katiya. So Katiya noble was the next expression to arise. He charms the others by the Dhamma. By what ought to be charmed is what is meant by Raja. So this was the third standing phrase to arise. Thus then, Vesheta was the origin of this social circle of the nobles according to the ancient primordial phrases by which they were known. Their origin was from amongst those very beings and, none, and no others like unto themselves, not unlike, and it took place according to the Dhamma, according to what ought to be justly, not unfittedly, for, for Vaisita, the norm is the best amongst this folk, both in the life, in this life and in the next. Now it occurred, Vaisita, to some of those beings as follows. Evil deeds, sirs, have become manifest amongst us, inasmuch as stealing, censure, lying, punishment can be noticed and banishment. Let us now put away from us evil and unethical customs, and put and they put away from them such customs. They put away bahinti, evil, unethical customs, they say that, is what is meant by Brahmins. And thus was it that the Brahmins became the earliest standing phrase for those who did so. They making leaf huts in woodland spots meditated therein. Extinct for them the burning coal vanished the smoke, fallen lies pestle and powder gathering of an evening for the, the evening meal of a metan for the metan meal they do they go down into village and town and royal city seeking food when they have gotten food back again in their leaf huts they meditate when they saw this they said these benevolent beings have having made unto themselves leaf huts in the forest region meditate therein for them burning coal is extinct smoke is known no further hustle and powder have fallen from their hand they have they gather of an evening for the evening meal, of a matin for the matin meal, and go down into the village and town and country seeking food. When they have gotten food back again in their leaf huts, they meditate, they meditate Jayanti. Veseta is what is meant by the brooding one, Yayaka. Thus was it that this was the second phrase that arose. Now certain of those beings, they say, being incapable of enduring this meditation in forest leaf huts, went down and settled on the outskirts of villages and towns making books. When men saw this, they said, These benevolent beings, being incapable of enduring meditation in forest leaf huts, have gone down and settled on the outskirts of villages and towns, and there they make books, but they cannot meditate. Now these meditate not, they say, that is what is meant by ayayaka, repeaters of the Vedas. Thus this third phrase for such people came into utilization. At that time they were looked upon as the lowest, now they are that thought the best. Such then, Vesita, according to the ancient, yea, primordial expressions by which they were known, was the origin of the so this social circle of the Brahmins. Their origin was from just those beings above referred to, beings like unto themselves, not unlike, and it took place according to the Dharma, according to what ought to be justly, not unfittingly. For Vesita, the Dharma is the best amongst this folk, both in this life and in the next. Now, Vaisheta, there were some others of those beings who, adopting the married state, set on foot various trades. That they, adopting the married state, set on foot various visa trades is Vaisheta, the meaning of Vesa, tradesfolk. So this word came into utilization as a standing expression for such people. The origin, Vaisheta, of the social group called the Vesas was in accordance with this ancient, yea, primordial designation. It was from just those beings above describe beings like unto themselves not unlike and it took place in accordance with the dharma according to what ought to be done according to what ought to be justly not unfittingly for Vesita, the dharma is the best amongst this folk both in this life and in the in the next now Vesita, those of these beings that remained over took to hunting but those that lived on hunting and such like trifling pursuits is what is meant by suda the lowest grade of folk Thus then, according to the ancient, yea, primordial expression is the origin of a social group called Sudas. The origin was from those, just those beings. 
above described, beings like unto themselves, not unlike. And it took place according to the Dharma, according to what ought to be not unfitting, namely, from those who were not different from other beings, but like them, not unlike them, by a Dharma and not through lack of a Dharma. For Vaisaita, the Dharma is the best amongst this folk, and both in this life and in the next. Now there came a time, Vaisaita, when some Katiya, misprising his own norm, went forth from home into the homeless life, saying, I will become a recluse. Some Brahmin too did the same. Likewise, some Vaisaita, some, likewise, some Vesa and some Sutta, each finding some fault in his particular Dharma. Out of these four groups or circles, Vaisaita, the company of the recluse became came into being. Their origin was from just these beings like unto themselves. Not different. And it took place according to a dharma, a fitness justly, not unfitting. For Vesita, the, the dharma is the best amongst this folk, both in this life and in the, in the next. Now, a Akhtiya, Vesita, who has led a bad life, indeed word and thought, whose views of life are wrong, will, in consequence of his views and deeds, when the body breaks up, be reborn after death in the waste, the woeful way, the downfall of purgatory. And a Brahmin, too, or a Vesa, too, a Sudha, too, who has led a bad life, indeed word and thought, whose views of life are wrong, will, in consequence of his views, be and deeds when the body breaks up be reborn after death in the waste the wolf away the downfall the purgatory again they say to a kataicha or brahmin or vesard suda who has led a benevolent life in deed word and thought whose views of life are as they should be will in consequence of his views and deeds when the body breaks up be reborn after death in a happy bright world again they say to a kasaicha who a brahmin to a vesa to a suda to who has lived a life of both benevolent and bad. Benevolent and bad, indeed, word and thought, whose views of life are mixed, will, in consequence of his mixed views and deeds, when the body breaks up, be reborn after death, suffering both happiness and unhappiness. Again, Vesita, Kasaicha, a Brahmin to a Vesa to a Suda to who is self-restrained in deed, word, and thought, and, at, and has followed after the practice of the seven principles, which are the wings of wisdom, attains to complete extinction of evil in this present life. For Vesita, whosoever of these four classes becomes a, as a bhikshu, an arhat, who has destroyed the intoxicants, who has done that which it, it behooved him to do, who has laid down the burden, who has won his own salvation, who has wholly destroyed the fetter of re-becoming, who through knowledge made perfect is free, he is declared chief amongst them in virtue of a dharma, not in the absence of a dharma. For Vesita, the dharma is the best amongst this folk, both in this life and in the next. Now this verse, Vesita, was spoken by Brahma, the eternal youth. The Kasaitya is the best amongst this folk who put their trust in lineage. But one in wisdom and in virtue clothed is best among, of all amongst spirits and men. Now the stanza of Vesita was well sung and not ill sung by Brahma, the eternal youth, well said and not ill said, full of meaning and not void thereof. I too, Vesita, say, the Kataitya is the best amongst this folk who put their trust in lineage, but one in wisdom and in virtue clothed is best amongst, of, is best of all amongst spirits and men. Thus spake the Exalted One, pleased at heart, Vesita, and the Bhardvaja, rejoiced in what the Exalted One had said. Gospels. John Nueve Adies. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of God who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. Whilst I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground and made some mud with the saliva and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told them, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means scent. 
So the man went and watched and came home seen. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, No, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes open? they asked. He replied, The man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told them to go he told me to go to Silo Am and wash, so I went and washed and then I could see. Where is this man? they asked him. I don't know, he said. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was Shabbat. Therefore the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed it, now I see. So the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep Shabbat. But others asked, How can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. Then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes. He opened. The man said, He is a prophet. They still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son? they asked. Is this the one who you say was born blind? How is it that he now he, see, he can see? We know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. But how he can see now, or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish brethren leaders, who already had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, he is of age, ask him. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth. They said, We know this man is a sinner. He replied, Whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I have told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they hurled insults at him and said, You are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moshe. We know that God spoke to Moshe, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, Now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. God listens to the holy person who does God's will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of, of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, You were steeped in a sin at birth. How dare you look to us? And they threw him out. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, and he had, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Master, I believe, and he honored him. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will have seen will see and those who will see and those who see will become blind some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked what are we blind too Jesus said if you were blind you would not be guilty of sin but now that you claim that you can see your guilt remains very truly I tell you Pharisees anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact they will run away from him because they do not recognize the stranger's voice. Jesus utilized this figure of speech but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore Jesus said again, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the benevolent shepherd. The benevolent shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the benevolent shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Creator knows me and I know the Creator, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. 
I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my Creator loves me is that I lay down my life, only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Creator. The Jewish brethren who heard these words were again divided. Many of them said, He is demon-possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? But others said, These are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Then came the festival of dedication at Yerushalayim. It was winter. And Jesus was in the temple courts, walking in Solomon's colony. The Jewish brethren who were there gathered around him, saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you do not believe. The works I do in my Creator's name testify about me. But you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they know, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Creator, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No, no one can snatch them out of my Creator's hand. I and the Creator are one. Again, his Jewish brethren opponents picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus said to them, I have shown you many benevolent works from the Creator. Which of these do you stone me? For which of these do you stone me? We are not stoning you for any benevolent work, they replied, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I have said you are deities. If he called them deities, to whom the word of God came, the scripture cannot be set aside. What about the one whom the Creator set apart as God's favorite, very own, and sent into the world? Why then do you accuse me of blasphemy because I am because I said I am God's son? Do not believe me unless I do the works of my Creator. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Creator is in me and I am the Creator. Again they tried to seize him, but he escaped their grasp. Then Jesus went back across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing in the early days. There he stayed. And many people came to him. Therefore, they said, Though John never performed a sign, all that John said about this man was true. And in that place, many believed in Jesus. Quran, Surah Az Zaria, and Surah Atur, numero 51 a 52. Surah Az Zaria, Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim, in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. By the winds that scatter broadcast, and those that lift and bear away heavy weights, and those that flow with ease and gentleness, and those that distribute and apportion by command. Verily that which ye are promised is true, and verily judgment and justice must indeed come to pass. By the sky with its numerous paths, truly ye are in a doctrine discordant, though through which are deluded away from the truth such as would be deluded. Woe to the false mongers, those who flounder heedless in a flood of confusion. They ask, when will be the day of judgment and justice? It will be a day when they will be tried and tested over the fire. Taste ye your trial. This is what ye used to ask to be hastened. As to the righteous, they will be in the midst of gardens and springs, taking joys in the things which their Lord gives them, because before then they lived a benevolent life. They were in the habit of sleeping but little by night, and in the hour of early dawn they were found praying for forgiveness. And in their wealth and possessions was remembered the right of the needy, him who asked, and him who, for some reason, was prevented from asking. On the earth are signs for those of assured faith, as also in your own selves will ye not then see, and in heaven is your sustenance, as also that which ye are promised. Then by the Lord of heaven and earth this is the very truth, as much as the fact that ye can be speak intelligently to each other. As the story reached thee of the honored guests of Abraham, behold, they entered his presence and said, Peace. He said, Salam. Behold, they entered his presence and said, Salam. He said, Salam. And thought, These seem unusual people. Then he quickly he turned quickly to his household, brought out a fatted calf, and placed it before them. He said, Will ye not eat? 
When they did not eat, he conceived a fear of them. They said, Fear not, and they, they gave him glad tidings of a son and died with knowledge. But his wife came forward laughing aloud. She smote her forehead and said, A barren old woman. They said, Even so has the Lord spoken, and Allah is full of wisdom and knowledge. Abraham said, And what, O ye messengers, is your errand now? They said, We have been sent to a people deep in sin, to bring on them, to bring on, on them a shower of stones and clay, of clay brimstone, marked as from thy Lord for those who trespass beyond bounds. Then we evacuated those of the believers who were there, but we found not there any just Muslim persons except in one house. And we left there a sign for such as fear the grievous penalty. And in Moshe was another sign. Behold, we sent to him to we sent him to Pharaoh with authority manifest. But Pharaoh turned back with his chiefs and said, A sorcerer, or one possessed. So he took him and his forces and threw them into the sea, and his was the blame. And the and in the odd people was another sign. Behold, we sent against them the devastating wind. It had left nothing whatever that it came up, up against, but reduced it to ruin and rottenness. And in the Talmud was another sight. Behold, they were old, they were told, Enjoy your brief day for a little while. But they insolently defied the command of their Lord. So they so the stunning noise of an earthquake seized them, even whilst they were looking on. Then they could not even stand on their feet, nor could they help themselves. So were the people of Noah before them, for they wickedly, for they wickedly transgressed. With power and skill did we construct the firmament, for it is we who create the vastness of pace. With power and skill do we construct the firmament, for it is we who create the vastness of space. And we have spread out the spacious earth, how excellently we do spread out. And of everything we have created pairs, that ye may receive instruction. Hasten ye then at once to Allah, I am from Allah a warner to you, clear and open. And make not another an object of worship with Allah, I am from Allah a warner to you, clear and open. Similarly, no apostle came to the peoples before them, but they said of him, in like manner, a sorcerer, or one possessed. Is this the legacy they have transmitted one to another? Nay, they are themselves a people transgressing beyond bounds. So turn away from them, not thine is the blame, but teach th thy message, for teaching benefits the believers. I have only created jinns and men, that they may serve me. No sustenance do I require of them, nor do I require that they should feed me. For Allah is Allah who gives all sustenance, Lord of power, steadfast forever. For the wrongdoers, their portion is like unto the portion of their fellows of earlier generations. Then let them not ask me to hasten that portion. Woe then to the unbelievers on account of that day of theirs which they have been promised. Surah At-Tur, Sikhunda Dos. Bismillah ar rahim in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. By the mount of revelation, by a decree inscribed in a scroll unfolded, by the much frequented fane, by the canopy raised high, and by the ocean filled with swell, verily the doom of thy Lord will indeed come to pass. There is none can avert it. On the day when the firmament will be in dreadful commotion, and the mountains will fly hither and thither, then woe that day to those that treat truth as falsehood that play a paddle in shallow trifles. That day, shall be, that day shall they be thrust down to the fire of hell irresistibly. This, it will be said, is the fire which ye will want to deny. Is this then a fake, or is it ye that do not see? Burn ye therein, the same is it to you, whether ye be bear it with patience or not. Ye but receive the recompense of your own deeds. As to the righteous, they will be in gardens and in happiness, enjoying the bliss which their Lord hath bestowed on them, 
and their Lord shall deliver them from the penalty of the fire. To them will be said, Eat and drink ye with benefit and health because of your benevolent deeds. They will recline with ease on thrones of dignity arranged in ranks, and we shall join them to companions with beautiful, big, and lustrous eyes. And those who believe and whose families follow them in faith, to them shall we join their families, nor shall we deprive them of the fruit of aught of their works, yet is each individual in pledge for his deeds. And we shall bestow on them of fruit and meat anything they shall desire. They shall there exchange one with another a loving cup free of frivolity, free of all taint of ill. Round about them will serve devoted to them youths handsome as pearls well guarded. They will advance to each other, engaging in mutual inquiry. Then they will say, Aforetime we were not without fear for the sake of our people, but Allah has been Allah has been benevolent to us and has delivered us from the penalty of the scorching wind. Truly we did call unto Allah from of old. Truly it is Allah the beneficent, the, the merciful. Therefore proclaim thou the praises of thy Lord, for by the grace of thy Lord thou art no vulgar, vulgar soothsayer, nor art thou one possessed. Or do they say, A poet, we await for him some calamity hatched by time. Say thou, Await ye, I too will wait along with you. Is it that their faculties of understanding urge them to this, or are they but a people transgressing beyond bounds? Or do they say, He fabricated the message, nay, they have no faith. Let them then produce a recital like unto it, if it be they speak the truth. Were they created of nothing, or were they themselves the creators? Or did they create the heavens and the earth? Nay, they have no firm belief. Or are the treasures of thy Lord with them, or are they the managers of affairs? Or have they a ladder by which they can climb up to heaven and listen to his secrets? Then let such a listener of theirs produce a manifest proof. Or has Allah only daughters, and ye have sons? Or is it that thou dost ask a for a reward, so that they are burdened with a load of debt, or that the unseen in it, or that the unseen in it, Or that the unseen is in their hands, and they write it down? Or do they intend a plot against thee, but those who defy Allah are themselves involved in a plot? Or have they a deity other than Allah? Exalted is Allah much above the things they associate with Allah. Were they to see a portion of the sky falling on them, they would only say, Clouds gathered in heaps. So leave them alone until they encounter that day of theirs wherein they shall perforce So leave them alone until they encounter that day of theirs wherein they shall perforce swoon with terror. The day when their plotting will avail them nothing, and no help shall be given them. And verily, for those who do wrong, there is another punishment besides this, but most of them understand not. Now await in patience the command of thy Lord, for verily thou art in our eyes, and, s and celebrate the praises of thy Lord, the while thou standest forth. And for part of the night also praise thou Allah, and at the retreat of the stars. Te Ching, chapter 67 a 72. 67. Everyone in the world calls my Tao great, as if it is beyond compare. It is only because it is, it is only because of its greatness that it seems beyond compare. If it can be compared, it would already be insignificant long ago. I have three treasures. I hold on to them and protect them. The first is called compassion. The second is called conservation. 
The third is called not daring to be ahead in the world. Compassionate, thus able to have courage. Conserving, thus able to reach widely. Not daring to be ahead in the world, thus able to assume leadership. Now if one has courage but discards compassion, reaches widely but discards conservation, goes ahead but discards being behind, then death. If one fights with compassion, then victory, with defense, then security. Heaven shall save them, and with compassion guard them. Santa Ocho. The great generals are not warlike. The great warriors do not get angry. Those who are beneficial at defeating enemies do not engage them. Those who are beneficial at managing people lower themselves. It is called the virtue of non-contention. It is called the power of managing people. It is called being harmonious with heaven, the ultimate principle of the ancients. Sesenta Nueve. In utilizing the military, there is a saying, I dare not be the host, but prefer to be the guest. I dare not advance an inch, but prefer to withdraw a foot. This is called marching in formation without formation, raising arms without arms, grappling enemies without enemies, holding weapons without weapons. There is no greater disaster than to underestimate the enemy. Underestimating the enemy almost made me lose my treasures. So when evenly matched armies meet, the side that is compassionate shall win. Setenta. My words are easy to understand, easy to practice. The world cannot understand, cannot practice. My words have basis, my actions have principle. People do not understand this, therefore they do not understand me. Those who understand me are few, thus I am highly valued. Therefore the sage wears plain clothes, but holds jade. Setenta uno. To know that you do not know is highest. To know but think you know is flawed. To not know but think you know is flawed. Only when one recognizes the fault as fault can one be without fault. The sages are without fault because they recognize the fault as fault. That is why they are without fault. Setenta dos. When people no longer fear force, they bring about greater force. Do not limit their place, do not reject their livelihood. Because the rulers do not reject them, therefore they do not reject the ruler. Therefore the sages know themselves but do not glorify themselves, respect themselves but do not honor themselves. Thus they discard that and take this. Alhamdulillah, Rahman Rahim, Allah wa Pah. They are snows there, Kiyas and Chiris, some of the people in the room, Bahigu Salam. Dakuda, Fehmuda. Ja, Baruchata, Arunai, Elohino Melacha Alam, Ashikizan, Bamizu, Wata, Bizivanu. Baruchata, Arunai, Elohino Melacha Alam, Hamodzi, Lechem, Haretz. Amen. Curialism. Several must do subjugate him. Sabe Sata Bhavantu Suki Tata Bhagabiya Ubuntu Shabana Fekako Akwaba Upinda Naamani Woman Jibam Shesha Tomasunila Domo Arigato Kudama Yela Wahanta Talk Adokashin Guru God we thank you for our two blessings Guru Nidika Ata Jamia Yatafna Aho Om Shanti 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 Alhamdulillah Rahman Rahim, Allah wa Pah. Deyo Sumaste, Kiyas and Chalis, Santifikita Namaturum, Bahigur Salam. Dao Kedao Fehmda. Ja. Ba'lu Khata Arnai, Elahina Melech Alam, Asher Gizam, Bumi Sultan, Vizibanum, Yisof Gurvay Tore. Amen. Kiriya Laysum. Sifu Masri Sabaji Gatahi. Sabaya Sata, Bavadu Suki Tatan. Fagabiyya. Kumbutu. Shabbat. Fagabiyya. Aqwaba upindana amani. Ninja. 
シェシェ、クロスニーワン、どうもありがとう。ヘルマイエロー、ウォークンタップ、トーク、オブロシングル。ガウィズンティフォーチュブラスンス、ゴールドガール。アータジアメヤバフマン、アホー、オンシャンティシャンティシャンティ。ナマステ、アスラムレイコン、シャロン、ザジェン、アリオス、テヘチャクリス、アスムー、ケレディフレイド。アロー、ピース。